I want to explain what I think the word faith should really mean from God's point of view. Faith for God must have nothing to do with the usual definition to believe in God's existence. I have faith in God, or I have faith in Jesus, or faith that the Bible is the word of God. God wants us to have nothing to do with believing in his existence. You wouldn't be free to show your true moral character. If you believe in God, even if there is no God, you're scared by that thought in your mind, God is watching, and you're not free. And of course, I think a lot of parents do this to their kids very deliberately. Convince them, God is watching you. So, even if there is no God, they're scared by that thought that God is watching them. And that's why there's less venereal disease at the Catholic USD than at SDDSU. And so, you wouldn't be free. And also, it isn't fair to have to believe in God. Not everyone has heard of God. You wouldn't think I was fair if when you walked in the first day I set a seating chart and didn't let you move and then proceeded to whisper my lecture in such a way that those of you sitting over here could hear it just fine and since I'm making everything come out of the lecture you have every chance to hear it, to understand it, to pass the course to get an A but I whispered in such a way that those of you sitting over here couldn't hear it and through no fault of your own I failed you I made you sit here, I didn't let you hear the lecture I made everything come out of the lecture and then I failed you you wouldn't think that was fair. You would go and complain. We should all be with you. That's not fair. For me to be fair, I have to give my lectures my word equally to all of my students. And so the same thing with God. He can't pick out some people, those of you born in the Western world, or places where the missionaries have reached. Because sometimes people say to me, oh, we know not everybody has heard the word. That's why we send out missionaries, Professor. Misses the point. What about the people the missionaries didn't get to? Those of you born in the Western world, places where the missionaries have reached, you get the word, you can be saved. <clears throat> Those of you born outside the Western world, you don't get the word. You're going to be damned to hell for all of eternity and through no fault of your own. You didn't choose not to be born in the Western world. It wasn't your fault you couldn't travel to the Western world. It wasn't your fault the missionaries didn't reach you with the word and then God failed, damns you to hell for all of eternity. That wouldn't be fair either. Just like for me to be fair, I have to give my word equally to everybody, the chance to pass equally to everybody. So God would have to give the chance to pass the chance to be saved equally to everybody. And so the first conclusion I would draw from this, there are no chosen people. All religions must be equally good, although lots of religions, almost all of them, think of themselves as the chosen people. Being born and raised Jewish, I was taught Jews were the chosen people, and I thought everybody knew that. Then I started teaching at a Catholic university, and when I mentioned God's favorite religion, they thought I was talking about Catholics. I was stunned. I thought everybody knew it was us Jews. But then I realized Jesus was their homeboy. I shouldn't have been very surprised. And generally when I have Muslims in my class, they assure me their religion is by far the most beautiful. All of that, nothing more than ethnocentricity and bigotry, as best I can tell. No shortage of those qualities among us humans. My group is the best. You all knew that, didn't you? Kind of makes God out to be an arbitrary bigot. Also, like a teacher who would give some student something especially beautiful and deny it to others. I don't know why anybody thinks God would be happy being characterized like that. In the name of fairness, equal opportunity, justice for all, all religions must be equally good. They must all provide what's necessary in order to pass God's test, in order to be saved. They all must teach the golden rule, God's truth, love your neighbor, God is love, love your neighbor as yourself. And as best I can tell, all the major religions do teach the golden rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Google golden rule across the religions, like 36 different religions come up. Of course, Islam, I'll mention, controversial nowadays. No one is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. Hopefully the sisters will be included there somewhere also. They're all equally good. They all teach love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe they're also all equally bad because they give commandments and take away your freedom to show your true moral character. Really, I'm trying to argue religion is irrelevant. God wants you to doubt your 
religion. Otherwise, you're not doing it freely out of moral character. You're just doing it because your religion tells you to do it. So what has God given everyone to teach them right from wrong? What is traditionally called a conscience, the main philosopher here, Jiminy Cricket, let your conscience be your guide. Everybody has a conscience. Everybody knows mean people suck. Treat others with the respect and dignity you yourself would like to be treated with. And so there is no excuse for bad behavior. You can't say, nobody taught me right from wrong. How was I supposed to know? My mother was a junkie. My father was a drunk. My brothers and sisters beat me and sold me as a sex slave from young childhood. Nobody ever taught me right from wrong. How was I supposed to know? No. You know you didn't like being abused. That's all you need to teach you. Don't abuse others. In fact, of course, you yourself don't even have to actually be abused. You just have to think about it. How would I like it if somebody did something like that to me? And if you wouldn't like it, that's all you need to teach you. Don't do it to others. Everyone has a conscience. Everyone knows. And so I know I used to ask myself when I was growing up, well, why do I have to go to synagogue? Why can't I just love my neighbor as myself? And I wondered if there were little Christians going into church thinking, why do I have to go to church? Why can't I just listen to my conscience and love my neighbor as myself? Muslims, I've learned there are. Why do I have to go to mosque? Why can't I just love my neighbor as myself? Buddhist, Hindu, why do I have to go to the temple? Why can't I just love my neighbor as myself? Now I have tried to show you don't have to go to synagogue or church or mosque or temple. If any of that was required, that wouldn't be fair to people who've never heard of a synagogue or never heard of a church or never heard of a mosque or never heard of a temple. Actually, all of this, going to the institutions, doing the rituals, praise the Lord, mostly it seems people there are just being selfish. They just want God to like them better, give them something better in heaven. As one of my Catholics wrote, hey God, I'm in here praising you. How about some bonus points for me? Or as another guy wrote, what God? You mean I'm in here praising you instead of being out enjoying my life and you're not even going to give me anything extra? What the hell am I doing here? I gotta go out! Or one of my students told me, he walked out of my lectures and saw one of the preachers and the uh, quad uh, condemning the students to hell for the sinners that they are. And he went up to the preacher and said, but if you're just doing it to get to heaven, then you're not really doing it because you want to, right? You're not really doing it because you're a good person, right? You're just doing it to get to heaven and get a big reward for yourself, aren't you? You're just being selfish, aren't you? He told me, the preacher replied, son, you're thinking about this too deeply. But mostly, of course, it's just being selfish. Bonus points for me, a better place in heaven. And so in fairness, just listen to your conscience, love your neighbor as yourself. Brings me to one of my favorite Bob Marley lyrics, his famous, sick and tired of your isms, schisms. Try to go to heaven with your hisms, isms. Your isms, schisms. The schism, of course, the separation, the schism in the church, the separation among all the different religions, separated, hostile, killing each other. Jews and Muslims in the Holy Land, Muslims and Hindu, India, Pakistan, Protestants and Catholics in Ireland, sick and tired of your hism schisms, all of these religions fighting with each other, killing each other, who's got the best religion, who's got the best scripture, who's got the best interpretation of God's word. God's word is love your neighbor as yourself. How do you get out of that fight with your neighbor and kill your neighbor? Sick and tired of your hism schisms. Think you're going to heaven with your hism schisms? Oh, I'm going to heaven. God loves me. I got the right ism. I got Judaism. I got Catholicism. I got Protestantism. I got Muslimism. I got Mormonism. I got Buddhism, I got Hinduism. It isn't a matter of your ism. To mix Bob Marley and Martin Luther King, inspiration came to me on a Martin Luther King day. I have a dream. The day that people will no longer be judged by the color of their skin or by their ism, but only by the content of their character. Obviously, what else should count? And I have this out with my old mother, still alive sometimes nowadays. She's very upset that I married, I'm sorry to say, a woman with brown skin and I have white skin, but she's especially upset that I married out of my religion. I'm a Judaism. She's a Buddhism. Steve, you married the wrongism. She's a Buddhism. You're a Judaism. You married the wrongism. And I try to explain to the old lady, if you can still explain things to old people, you don't judge a person by the color of their skin or by their ism. Only by the content of their character. 
of course, what else should count? So for the definition of faith, I've made it free. You don't know there's a God in heaven who will reward you. So what you're doing is free, just out of the virtue that's in your heart. And I've made it fair. You don't have to have an ism. Not everybody has your ism, but everybody has a conscience. Be nice. Mean people suck. I've made it free. I've made it fair. What makes it faith? This is my favorite part. Far from its being the case that you know there is a God in heaven who will reward you, how much different our weekends would be if we knew for sure there is a God in heaven who will reward me greatly if I work for charity, punish me horribly for any hedonistic partying that I do. You don't know that at all. In fact, all you do know, all that earthly wisdom teaches you, if you are a loving person, what happens to you in this world? I remember one student yelled out, people love you back. Wrong answer. I presume she learned later in her life they were only pretending to love her back really they wanted something from her of course I also once had a student wearing a shirt that said be kind I immediately pointed out to her that would be an invitation to unscrupulous people to come up and try to take advantage of her this one believes in being kind let's go see what we can get from her they'll use you they'll abuse you you'll get screwed again and again in the end your nickname will be here come sucker if in the face of that you continue to shine with the spirit of true love. You don't become bitter and selfish, turn sinful selfish. You continue to be loving. Even if you finish last, I call that faith in love as the right way to live. Faith because you don't get anything for it except screw. Continue to be loving anyway. That's faith in love. And since it says in the Bible and on my shirt, God is love. Faith in love is faith in God because God is love. Of course, faith in God sounds unfair. Not everyone has heard of God, but faith in love is fair. Any tension will dissolve if you really mean that God is love. And so the thing that's unseen in that famous Bible passage, faith is faith in things unseen. The unseen thing is not heaven. I don't know about heaven. If I'm even thinking I'll go to heaven, now I'm looking for a reward. It's not true love. I wouldn't even be worthy of going to heaven. So the reward must be somehow here in this life. And I try to argue only loving people can have a meaningful life. Love is the meaning of life, but that's unseen. That's the thing that's unseen. You can see into people's hearts. Are you a loving person? Does that really give you a meaningful life, really? As people are taking advantage of you, you're finishing last, they're laughing at you and calling you a sucker. It's okay because you're loving. Inside your life is meaningful. I can't see that. That's unseen. Selfish people have meaningless knives because they're not loving. I don't see that. What I see is that they look happy pursuing all of their selfish pleasures. Really, they're not. Because they're not loving, deep down inside, their life can't be meaningful. I can't see that. That's unseen. And so, as my mommy used to teach me, share your toys. You'll feel better inside. No, I won't. You know what happens when you share your toys? Other kids don't play as carefully with your toys as they play with their own toys. Eventually, they broke my toys. After they broke my toys, did they let me play with their toys? Of course they didn't. They knew they just broke my toys. If I get my hands on their toys, what might I do in retaliation? I might break their toys. And even though we were kids, they weren't stupid. They knew that. So my toys are broken. I have no toys. I'm crying. They have toys. They're playing. They're happy. And there's my idiot mother telling me you'll feel better inside. I used to wonder what I had done to deserve to have such a stupid mother. But now I find this is exactly what I'm arguing, except I couldn't see that I would feel better inside. All I saw was that they broke my toys. And I once had a student put up her hand and say, feel better inside, but how long is it going to take? It was the end of a period and students were packing up and rustling and making noise and I couldn't fight it, so I just dismissed the class. Then I went home and started thinking about her question and the tone of exasperation and frustration. How long is it going to take? And so I surmised, and maybe this is true of some more of you, that she was a very nice person and people are constantly taking advantage of her and she's finishing last and she's starting to wonder if she's just a sucker and she should become bitter and become selfish like everybody else. How long is it going to take until I feel better inside? Because right now I just feel like an idiot a sucker. And I didn't know what to say. Hopefully before you die, it would be nice. Although I realized, thinking about it further, you can't even be sure of that. What really makes it faith, you can't be sure you'll ever feel better inside. My favorite example coming up, the Indians at Thanksgiving. 
If I remember the story, the white European colonist lands too far north on the Atlantic coast. It's way colder than they thought it would be. They're freezing. They're starving. Looks like they're all going to die from nature. Out of the forest comes the Indian, the red man, being the nice guy, bringing the turkey, bringing the corn, saves the white man's ass. Then what does the white man do to the Indian as soon as that first terrible winter is over? We slaughter the Indian. We break every treaty we make with them. We lie to them at every turn. We attack the Indian with blankets laced with smallpox, biological warfare against the Indians, that's killing civilians, children, that's a crime against humanity. We make the Indians live on reservations in hot, dusty, ugly Oklahoma. Such a stunningly ugly place, no San Diegan even wants to think about it. Anybody ever sweat in a dusty area? The dust gets into your sweat, sticks to your skin, it's really disgusting. As the Indians are sweating in the dust of ugly Oklahoma, what are they thinking to themselves? Oh, the white man stole Manhattan from us. The white man stole La Jolla from us. The white man stole Colorado from us. We're sweating in the dust of ugly Oklahoma, but hey, we were nice, so we feel good inside. How many of my students told me, oh yeah, I think the Indians feel pretty good about that. It was called the Trail of Tears. Doesn't sound like they were very happy. Faith, that being loving, godly, loving God is love, is the right way to live. And I remember I once had a student come up to me at the end and say, Steve, you made fun of everything this semester, as you'll see. You even made fun of the idea that if you're nice, you're going to feel good about it. Yes, I just did. And that wasn't nice of me either.